Last time I mentioned the big trends in animals invading the plankton, digging deep, and growing tall. Now we look at some other big trends, particularly that of predation. One clue that there is a big secular trend in predation is the products of eating all those animals, namely the shell debris left behind. We see a decided trend towards more shell pavements in the younger record. Shell beds can be enormously thick, 10 meters or more today, whereas I've never seen Paleozoic shell beds that were more than a few centimeters thick. Further, the Paleozoic beds are mainly those of whole shells, often brachiopods, whereas the modern shell beds are often broken shells of clams and snails. The trend in shell beds is part of a larger trend in animal mobility, body size, and prowess at both predation and defense. Now, Jack Sapkowski was one of the first to quantify the overall picture. He used factor analysis to identify animal classes that tend to achieve their maximum family level diversity at the same time. His analysis identified three evolutionary faunas composed of animal classes that showed similar diversity histories. He identified, for instance, a Cambrian fauna dominated by near bottom deposit feeders and grazers, including abundant trilobites, inarticulate brachiopods, early echinoderms like eocrinoids, and monoplacophoran mollusks. He also described a Paleozoic fauna made of epifaunal suspension feeders like articulate brachiopods, bryozoans, corals, cephalopods, and crinoids. A third major group was the modern fauna, characterized by mobile infauna and predators including mollusks, crabs, echinoid uh, echinoderms, um, sharks, fish, modern corals, things like that. Notably, some members of the Cambrian and Paleozoic faunas are still around, even if they have been superseded mainly by younger faunas. Likewise, the modern fauna made its first appearance at the dawn of the Cambrian. So, as Shakespeare says, there's really nothing new under the sun. <laughs> but it turns out there are changes in time over how well animal groups are represented. One of the striking trends in marine animal evolution seen in Sapkowski's evolutionary faunas is the changeover in the great mobility of animals over time. Dick Bombach noted, for instance, that the Paleozoic fauna is dominated by sessile groups that were anchored in place or moved rarely. Brachiopods, for instance, just sit there, as do crinoids, stony bryozoans, and sponges, all typical members of the Paleozoic fauna. In contrast, the modern fauna is full of active, mobile animals, including many predators. Think fish, squids, marine reptiles, even neogastropods, heart urchins, and stingrays. The change in mobility is particularly pronounced in the aftermath of the great Permo-Triassic mass extinction about 250 million years ago, in which the Paleozoic fauna was nailed and the modern fauna came into its own. To be sure, there are predators as far back as the Cambrian, of course. Think of the Cambrian terror Anomala Caris, and even members of the small shelly fauna probably dealt with predators. For instance, the flat phosphatic shells of the small shelly fauna probably are coverings for some animal living in a tube, likely to escape predation. But evidence of predation in the form of bite marks, drill holes, crushing claws, big teeth, etc., greatly increases in frequency in the Mesozoic fauna compared to the Paleozoic fauna. We see, for instance, almost no examples of predatory drill holes in the Paleozoic, but these are common in the Mesozoic and Cenozoic. We also see little shell crushing by crabs, fish, and marine tetrapods before the Cenozoic. Then there are those Cenozoic shell pavements that I mentioned before, which are made of the crushed shells of bivalves, gastropods, barnacles, and other invertebrates. In contrast, Paleozoic shell beds are typically not made of the remains of somebody's lunch, the way they are in the Cenozoic. The rise in predators has been dubbed the Mesozoic Marine Revolution. The idea is that predators get better at crushing shells by developing stronger crushing claws like crabs, or stronger jaws like fish and rays. This increase in predator ability leads to an arms race with prey that in turn develop better defenses. The defenses include things like burrowing, stronger shells, ornamented shells, thick lips on gastropod shells, swimming ability in scallops, and the agile abilities of squids, amongst many other responses. The arms race analogy suggests that animals are spurred in developing defenses because they will get munched on if they don't. 
In turn, as the prey get better at defense, the predators have to up their game in offense. We see some of this history in the evolutionary records of animals that play a big part in the Mesozoic marine revolution, namely the fish and the cephalopods. Fish appear in the early Cambrian of China about 518 million years ago. These are chordates characterized by a notochord, a stiffened rod, a dorsal nerve cord, and chevron-folded muscles. The early chordates lack jaws. Another name for them is that they were agnathans, meaning no jaws. These animals resemble modern branchiostoma that I mentioned in the last video. They mostly just sit in their burrows, filter feeding the water flowing right next to the sea floor. That water is rich in bits of organic detritus shed from algae, microbial mats, and invertebrate animals like sponges. These are good resources, and no active swimming is required to get them. Later fish developed jaws in the late Ordovician, about 470 million years ago. Jaws are derived from modified gill arches that were first used for respiration and the filter feeding approach of the agnathans. Jaws evolved in fishes that were using the gill arches to forcefully suck in water. The evolution of jaws makes the suction system even better. Suction feeding involves rapid opening of the jaws and then opening of the gill covers, creating a pressure difference that sucks food into the fish's mouth. These suction feeders don't even have to move if the prey is close enough. The strategy is just to lie in wait and then... <laughs> now, I had not fully appreciated how important suction feeding is until recently. My work on the fossil record of fossil fish teeth, um, for example, finds that it is evident that almost all fish have tiny teeth relative to their body size. Rockfish, for example, a fish like that, might have uh, teeth the size of sandpaper grains. These tiny teeth are not used to chomp up prey but instead to hold prey and help it go down the gullet. The real action is in the rapid enlargement of the mouth cavity to create strong suction. To be sure, there are exceptions to this in reef fish. Some of them actually do process food with a battery of teeth. Some mid-pelagic fish also use long teeth, think about like an angler fish, to stab their prey. But these fish may have only one chance at feeding in six months or more, so they cannot afford to let their prey go. But despite these exceptions, most fish are suction feeders. The modern bony fishes are the major group to radiate in the Jurassic and Cretaceous. These are the teleos that have made suction feeding into a high art. Now, part of their upper jaw, called the premaxilla, can swing forward to more than double the volume of the fish's mouth. Here again, the shape and size and expansion of the mouth is the key innovation, not the development of jaws per se. By the way, if you doubt me about the importance of suction feeding, I have a personal experience with a fish called Charlie. Charlie was a three foot long African lungfish that lived in an aquarium in the lab at Harvard when I was a graduate student there. We would feed Charlie feeder goldfish, maybe two inches long. Charlie hardly ever moved, but just hung there in the water in the middle of his tank. The feeder goldfish had no idea what they were up against. If they chanced to swim near Charlie's mouth, which eventually they all did, Charlie might move slightly to adjust his position, but then he just forcefully opened his mouth and in an instant was crunching up the goldfish. There was no lunging, no pursuit, no real hunting on Charlie's part. Scary stuff, but a great illustration of the fish strategy of mostly letting suction do the dirty work. Suction feeding is the key innovation in fish. Now, cephalopods are another try at being an active predator in the seas. These start with nautiloids that appear in the Cambrian and probably bobbed along the bottom with a cap-shaped gas-filled shell, octopus-like feeding appendages, and jet propulsion with a siphon. The gas-filled shell was great because the nautiloids did not need to expend much energy while swimming. Initially, there is a great diversity of these animals, and most of them are near bottom, but pretty soon they diversify into the open ocean. Later, the ammonites develop a different way of regulating the gases in their shells, and many of them become fully pelagic. The shell is somewhat problematic, however, since it inhibits fast swimming and rapid changes in direction. The shell is a pest, because although it saves a lot of energy the animal would otherwise use to avoid sinking, the shell is cumbersome and slow. The shell really becomes a liability when fast-swimming sharks, bony fish, and marine reptiles come on the scene. 
since all are much speedier and more maneuverable than the shelled cephalopods. Consequently, evolution has tended to minimize the size of the shell, with nearly complete reduction in squids. Ammonoids hold their own through the end of the Mesozoic, suggesting that the rise of fish and marine reptiles was not the sole cause of their demise. But by then, the squids were well along in their radiation, having reduced the shell to an internal bladder of chambers, like the pen of a cuttlefish, and then a further reduction to a wisp of a pen in modern squids. A modern squid is an amazing thing to behold as a living animal, capable of turning on a dime, jetting off in this direction, and then changing course by 90 or 120 degrees in an instant. Even fish cannot match that ability to faint and dodge. So what's the story here? It's clear that animals have not only diversified in the oceans over the last 500 million years, but they've also become much more agile, bigger, and more tightly woven into competitive and predator-prey networks. Some of this reflects the arms race character of the Mesozoic Marine Revolution, the back and forth of move and counter move that makes everybody a better competitor or defender. But this may not be the whole story because it is also possible that animals just could not do some of these things earlier in Earth history, no matter how strong the selective pressures might have been. That story has to do with oxygen that we will develop in